You're turning to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23, verse 11. I'm going to read out of the Amplified Version. And then we're going to jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. And these are our two texts for this morning. Acts 23. And that same following night, the Lord stood before Paul and said, Take courage, Paul, for as you have borne faithful witness concerning me at Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. That's the scripture in Acts chapter 23. Now we jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. What a great verse. What an amazing verse. I want you to read that with me. If they got it up on the screen, they do. I want us to read that together. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us us. Amen. Can we say amen to the reading of God's Word? Amen. You can be seated. But turn around, shake somebody's hand, and smile at them real good. The story of Paul is, is an awesome story. It's filled with all kinds of action and drama and, and twists, plot twists, and things that that make it so interesting to even just read all the epistles. And he's written them from prison. He's wit written them from, from different places all around the world. And he's gone through so many things. I mean, Paul is, in my opinion, a superhero. He's better than Marvel, better than DC Comics, better than Batman or Superman. This guy is the Apostle Paul. And he is phenomenal. He stirred up quite a mess in Jerusalem. He's been all over the place. He's bold. He doesn't, he's not wimpy at all. He's not shy. He's not backward. He is telling everybody he knows all about Jesus and what he's discovered. If you remember, this is the same gentleman who was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee and a captain. He was someone who kind of instigated crusades all over the land looking for the cultic group of believers in Jesus. He was known for kidnapping them, beating them, putting them in prison, and even stoning them to death as he stood by. He never really picked up a rock himself, but he made sure he gave the order. And the Bible even gives us the example of Stephen as he stood with his enemies with rocks all in their hand, and it was Saul of Tarsus who nodded and they began to cast those stones at him while Paul, Saul, held Stephen's cloak. This was the, the man who was, by all, my, by all rights, he was a, a conservative mosaic law uh, abider. I mean, he was captain of it. He kept it tooth and nail. He, he, every part of it, he never failed to follow the law, to hold to the law. This same Saul, on a crusade on the Damascus Road, as he was heading towards uh, other cities that he, where he was going for the crusades, he was looking for Damascus, and as he was on the way with his army and with his people, they were all on this, this vengeful uh, crusade journey, determined that they would find the Christians and X them out. He was as faithful in his dedication to the law as he would be to the New Testament. He was loyal, committed, dedicated. And as he walked on that road, you know the story. I won't go into that deeply, but he walks, he's going, he's leading his team, and he gets on that Damascus road when suddenly a bright light shines. And He's blinded by it, and a voice speaks to him out of heaven and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in that moment, must have been revelation, Saul looks up into the sky and talks back to that voice, and he says, who are you, Lord? He knew enough to know that 
what he was experiencing. He was faithful enough to Jehovah. He was faithful enough to the law of Moses to recognize that this was something supernatural. This was from heaven. This was the Lord. He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, it is I, the voice said, of G Jesus, whom you persecute. It's hard for you to pick, prick against the goads. And from there, his life was transformed and changed. He was blind at that moment and was taken into a city where a gentleman was anointed by God, scared to death of him because all the Christians hid from Paul. They didn't want to see Paul coming, but here this guy is challenged by God's Holy Spirit to speak to him and to bring healing to him and then to mentor him. Paul turns from Saul of Tarsus into Paul the Apostle. The same Pharisee, the same Pharisee who held the clothes of Stephen, heard the prayer of Stephen as Stephen looked up into the heavens and said, Father, forgive them, but they don't know what they do. Do not lay this sin to their charge. Paul heard those words, and no doubt they rung through his mind all through those years as he became a believer. But aren't we glad today that God answers prayers? Because God answered the prayers of Stephen and God found mercy. Isn't it good? Isn't it wonderful? Aren't you happy to know that God doesn't give up on us? God doesn't quit on you. He never gives up. And he answers prayers. And he heard the cry of Stephen and he followed through with it. But I want to go back and read that text again. Paul getting this word after turmoil, he stirred up a mess. As I said, he's brought dissension and trouble all over Jerusalem. He's preaching Jesus. Once he got converted, he turned into a maniac for the Lord. He was preaching to everybody. He was preaching all over the land. Everywhere he went, he was constantly being a witness. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And as he was filled with the Spirit, he was following the admonition of the song we sang earlier. The fire was in him. The breath of God was over him. The Spirit of the Lord was in him. And he was making sure everyone knew that as fired up as he was over the law of Moses, he was just as fired up over the new and the living way, the Savior, the Messiah, who had indeed come, Jesus. And he preached everywhere he went. And as he preached, he stirred up this mess we're talking about. He made people so angry, they didn't want to hear it. They wanted to block him out. They're protesting. He's been arrested because he's been beaten, and they've tried their best to kill him outright. And so the authorities put him in jail so that he would be safe from these mobs, these crowds. You know, I look at that and I think, how... Could people be so cruel? How could they be so mean? And then I watch the news today. I watch the violence and the hatred, the mockery. People don't want to hear it. They don't want anybody telling them they need change or, or there's an answer to the crisis in their lives. They, they don't want anyone to tell them about Jesus. No, teach me, talk to me, help me appreciate every other false God, but don't mention him. You know, I, I was amazed. The, the one thought that I had, I, and all I'll say about it at this point, although I'm putting something together for a re reply, but the Olympics, the opening ceremony where they mocked Jesus with drag queens reenacting the Last Supper. When I saw that, my heart, why was my heart broken? Because you see, I, I listened to the interview. The guy who created it, he's like, we're just trying to bring unity. 
We're just trying to bring inclusivity. We want everyone, all people, no matter who you are or what you are, or how you love, or what, we want the whole world to just come together. All religions, everybody, every thought, all the atheists, all the Satanists, we just want the whole world to come together. We didn't mean to offend anybody. I heard him say those words. He said, we didn't mean to offend anybody. And I was like, amazing. This is the only thought that I had. Amazing. That you're talking unity. You're talking inclusivity. You want everyone to come together. Except the Christians. Accept the Christian. No, let's take their, their stance. Let's take their, their prize. Let's take their last supper. Let's make a mockery of it and bring the whole world in on it in the name of unity. Oh, come on. We have to understand the hatred for Jesus. The hatred against What's faith and hope and what's right? What's evil? We have to understand the things that are fighting against the righteousness of Christ, the love of Christ, the true unity. You know, it, there, people don't get it. They, they see our desire to bring a transformation into our lives, to bring cleansing and washing and forgiveness into our lives. They don't get it that we do. We look at the same people, the same folks in the world that they're looking at. And we, instead of parading them, we're praying that God will transform them and bring them into the place where they can serve and love Him as children and know eternal life forever. We're looking for that unity that is bigger than anything they've ever thought about. We're looking for the power of God to touch their lives. So we, we see, we see that in the hate and the violence of the people around Paul, they're outside the prison, they're protesting, they're screaming, they're, they're, they're spray painting graffiti. They're doing all those things and they're screaming out to kill the apostle, to kill the traitor. Because Paul, Saul of Tarsus, has betrayed them. And that's the, the feeling that you get, especially in these days. Let me tell you, there's something to be said for the fact that we're in the last days. There's something to be said about that, because sometimes that can become cliche to us, and we don't really take it as seriously as we ought to. We are living in the last days. We're living in the time the Scripture refers to as the coming of the Lord, the snatching away of the saints, the rapture of the church. We are getting ready for His appearance. But what's so beautiful about the story, the Scripture, the same night that they're screaming outside, Paul wondering if he was even going to make it through the night, Wondering if he would still live and be alive by morning. Suddenly, in that cell, the Bible tells us, and that same following night, the Lord. The Lord. Look at it. Capital L. The Lord. An appearance of Christ in the Word of God. The Lord stood beside Paul and said, Take courage. The New King James says, Be of good cheer. Paul, for as you have borne faithful witness concerning me at Jerusalem, where you are right now, so you must also bear witness at Rome, where you are going. So suddenly, out of nowhere, Paul's got a promise and an assurance that he is going to make it through the night. So I'm sure his demeanor changed, his attitude changed, because Paul is a believer. 
Paul's life has been transformed. The same God that spoke to him on the Damascus Road is the same God that spoke to him in that cell that night. And now he knows that no matter how loud they scream, no matter how hard they are violent, no matter how harsh they are, no matter what they try to do, they can try to break in if they want. It doesn't matter because God has given me a promise. His passport is stamped for Rome. He's going to Rome. Would you look at somebody and say, we're going to Rome? By hook or by crook. I never understood that saying, but, but I like it this morning. By hook or by crook, come what may, by fair means or foul, come hell or high water. We are going to Rome. Now, how does that translate? Of course, whatever God has spoken over our lives, over my life and yours, whatever promises he has given us in his precious holy word, those promises cannot be denied. They won't be denied. You don't ever have to look at a promise of God and say, I hope so. Hope in the Bible is never called a a hope so kind of mentality. Hope in the Bible is an anchor. Hope in the Bible has a name. We sing the song, the name is Jesus. We have a assurance and the promise that we are make, we're going to make it through. No matter how the trouble is, they've beaten Paul. There's been violence all over. The authorities have done their thing. He's basically on trial, but then in the middle of the night, the Lord shows up. The following night, the Lord stood by him. The same Lord. This is the Lord that spoke to the disciples and said, Go, go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel. Go to the jail, Brother Carpenter. Go to the nursing home. Go out on the street. Go wherever you are as a witness to the life-changing power of Christ. Go, and wherever you are, even if it finds you in jail, Jesus said, I will be with you. Paul wasn't alone, and you are never alone. You are never alone. So he said, be of good cheer. Take courage. This gives us insight into what God wants for the normal Christian life. I love Watchman Nee in his book, The Normal Christian Life. He doesn't (coughs) refer to the miracles and, and the supernatural and all the things that we we believe for in Christianity. He doesn't refer to that as, ooh, big, huge, massive, supernatural, unbelievable. He says it's normal. The normal Christian life is to see the miraculous take place. It's to see healings. It's to see restoration. It's to see God coming together to meet the needs of his people and to work the work in this earth. We see it. We hear it. We have testimonies of God touching, but so many people, even if God heals a headache, they're like ready to cheer and clap and practically run the aisles when it should be seen as, well, praise God he came through again. It should be normal. Be of good cheer. Take courage. There are a couple of words I want to give you this morning. We We sing about them, we preach about them, we talk about them. We've got them in our music on radio. We've got them everywhere. In the children's church, they'll talk about these words. There's two words more particularly that you almost hear every single week, and that is faith and hope. I love faith. I've come to understand how powerful faith is. Faith is a verb. Faith is action. Faith gets the attention of heaven. Faith is yet a simple thing as well. If you've been in church any length of time, you've heard it. If I had my choice to preach a message every week, I would look to preach faith. Faith. (coughs) Faith is, is the link between earth and heaven. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is 
and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There's this missing element. We sit back in our sanctimonious religious chairs and we wait for God to show up. We spend our lives dictating to God what he better do in order to get me to believe. We spend our lives searching after God to show himself when the Bible is clear to point out that we can't please God without faith and with that we don't believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him, we have the responsibility to make sure we believe. We can't save ourselves. We know salvation is a gift from God. But you and I together, we do have a responsibility, and that is that we must believe. We must believe. Doesn't matter how good you teach. Doesn't matter how good I preach. Doesn't matter if you're a great singer. Doesn't matter how much money you give or how faithful you are every Sunday of your life to come to church. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't please Him with any of those materialistic, outward ways of giving God praise. He doesn't look at your money. He doesn't look at your attendance. He isn't looking at your talent and your ability. Does He use those things? You better believe it. Does he bless over those things? Yes, yes, yes. Does he need them in us? Yes, he wants the economy of his kingdom to come together in those beautiful, wonderful things. But when it's all said and done and you stand at the presence of God, he's not going to pull out a receipt for your talent or a receipt for your faithfulness. Not even going to pull out a receipt for how much money you have given. He won't, that won't be there. And trust me, Debbie spoke this morning at the offering about the, the beauty and the, the gift, the blessing of giving. We understand these things God uses. He gives talent. He gives blessing. He uses our gifts in giving. But those are not, those are not the things that he will look for. And when I say faithful, he, it's important that we're faithful, but Salvation, true salvation, is about being a believer. Being a believer. That it shadows over every part of your life. That it's everything that you are and all the other things. But seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And then all the other things, all the blessings, all the talents, all the gifts, all the wonder of being in the body of Christ, all of that will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom. I love faith. I love faith. The world says, well, you know what? I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it. You probably said it before. If not, you've thought it and you've certainly heard it. Well, I'll believe it when I see it. That is not faith. That has nothing to do with faith. It's carnal. When it comes to God, the Word of God teaches us that I'll see it when I believe it. It's not I'll believe it when I see it. You've got to twist that around. I'll see it when I believe it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. That's faith. I'll see it when I believe it. You have to believe it first then you'll see it. Hope. Hope is another word I love. Hope is something that I hold close in my heart. And, and I always fight against that, well, someone will say, well, I hope he comes through. No, that's not what that means. Hope is an anchor. It's a stone. It's a rock. It's the rock that he builds his church on. Him, Jesus, he's our hope. And the hope of Christ is a sure thing. 
His promises are sure and amen. We have to know this, see this, adopt this into our heart and mind and live it. I heard, read an article, and I don't know if it's all documented and, and if it's absolutely 100% true, but it sounded really great for today. That should have gotten a smile or something. It said this. It's possible for a person to live, and I should ask Roger this, because he actually lived on the land in Survivor. So he could answer these questions. It's possible for a person to live up to 40 days without food. What the article said. It is possible to exist for nearly 10 days without water. One can live for up to 8 minutes without air. This article went on to say, but there's one thing it is impossible to live without, and that is hope. No man, no woman can live, will live, will want to live without hope. You can lose your business, your money, your family, but hope is the one thing you and I can't afford to lose. Without hope, you've lost everything already. Hope gives you purpose, keeps you alive. It helps you to climb over obstacles. It's hope that comes into our hearts whenever you've seen a movie where they're, they're down and they're in the middle of the, 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 the situation or the tragedy and, and somebody gets a little bit of hope for a moment. Man, the rest, everybody's attitude changes and they conquer and they get out there and we have a good ending. Hope climbs over obstacles when there's no one else there to help. Hope, hope is what carries us. Hope stirs up the mind to create and come up with possibilities, how you can get out. Hope sweetens the heart when bitterness bites. Hope will keep you holding on when everything else is slipping away from you. One writer said this, there's no medicine like hope, no incentive so great, and no tonic so powerful as the expectation of something better tomorrow. I don't know how you feel about it, but I love that old movie, Five and a Half Hours, the uh, Gone with the Wind. I watched that for five hours uh, years and years ago. And as I got to it, I, I was so intrigued by that movie, I, I memorized some of the lines. And I, I remember at the end when Scarlett O'Hara has been through all that she's been through, five hours of trouble. And she reaches down and she, she picks up a piece of dirt from Tara, her beloved plantation. She picks up that dirt and she says these words. As God is my witness, as God is my witness, they're not going to lick me. I'm going to live through this and when it's all over, I'll never be hungry again. She goes, no, nor any of my folk. And then it goes on, and then the very last line of the movie, she's walking, she's looking, the credits are getting ready to roll, and she says, after all, tomorrow is another day. Hope. Hope changes everything. The Bible calls Jesus our great hope. Isaiah 40 in verse 28, it says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men may stumble and fall. But those who wait, who hope on the Lord, will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hope. Hope in the Lord. That's where you are right now. Hope in the Lord. I don't know what's stopping you. I don't know what's depressed you, discouraged you, defeated you. I don't know what you're facing, but hope is an emotion of comfort. It says there's possibilities. It says anything can happen. With God, nothing shall be impossible. That's hope and faith all wrapped up in one. That's both together. Someone said, tough times do not last, 
but tough people do. I don't know how I feel about that last part of the line, but I will say this, tough times, they don't last. Man, we've got to put that down inside of us. God has given us every promise we will ever need to understand and know that there is hope and there is faith. It doesn't matter how lost they are. It doesn't matter how bad it's gotten. It doesn't matter what the doctor has said, what the lawyer said, what the boss said, what the wife said or the husband said. It doesn't matter. I have already seen you come too far in, in my life. You've come. You can't come to me with anything that would ever cause me to doubt God. I'm at the place with the devil himself coming. I'm not boasting. I'm just saying I've had some experiences and I've come to understand like Job did. He said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. I'm at the place where I don't sit around and ponder and question and have problems with my hope and my faith anymore. I know he put the sun out there this morning and I know that moon will be there tonight. You know why? Because God is faithful and he is true and sovereign and he's the real deal. You can count on him every time. It's people with faith. People with faith that last. They're the ones who outlast the storm. It may be a little tiny lady with hardly any, any body at all. She's just a scrawny little thing but she will be a powerhouse, a pillar. She'll be as strong as Samson when the storm is over because she doesn't need her own strength. She needs the one that will renew her strength through his. Amen? Nothing is impossible. I, my mama, she went on to heaven years ago, but she tried so hard to drill into her six children she said, don't you ever doubt him. Don't let the enemy take away your doubt. Don't be a spoiled brat on your knees. Don't look up to heaven and try to get him to answer to you. You remember who he is. You remember that he's faithful. You remember that he's good. You remember that he's always right. And if you will be obedient to him, if you'll follow after him, if you'll stay true to him, then you will always find yourself standing on the side of victory and testify. We outlast the storms when we understand who he is. Paul, Paul had that man, he looked at all the guys on 276 of them on that ship and he said, guys, the Lord has spoken to me this night. I've got to go to Rome. And he says that every single one of you are going to make it alive. You're going to be just fine as long as you stay in the boat. Stay here with me. Stay with me because I'm going to Rome. And I want to tell you today, Jesus has already said, I go to the Father. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's making it very clear. If you come after me, if you follow after me, you're going to get there. It doesn't matter what rages around you, what troubles you find yourself in. doesn't matter. If you stay true to faith, man, you are going to make it on gold. You're going to day, there's going to be a day you're going to stand in the beauties, the wonders, the glories of heaven. He promises us. That same night, the Lord spoke to Paul. He said, take courage, be of good cheer. As you have been a faithful witness in Jerusalem, you are going to be a faithful witness in Rome. And he was. He was. But man, it, it wasn't without its battles. Sometimes we think, you know, we, what's that song? I forget the guy who sang it, but I never promised you a rose garden. You know, so, so many people get disillusioned because they think that everything's supposed to be peachy keen. They think everything's supposed to be great. Everything's supposed to be right. Nothing's, we're not supposed to have any troubles. Jesus said, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be falsely accused. You're going to be thrown in jail. How many of you have been thrown in jail for the sake of Christ? Oh, well, then you've been pretty blessed. He says they're going to hate you. They're going to hate you. They're going to work against you. They're going to protest against you. They're not going to make life easy for you. He says, but be of good cheer. As I have overcome the world, so will you. This is the hope we carry inside of us. 
but yet we, we allow ourselves to, to fight and go through these storms, and then we get down and we look up and we're like, God, where are you? And he says, I'm right here. I said I would never leave you, but I am really getting tired of hearing your whining. We need to be strong, square our shoulders, get out there and believe God, believe him. Believe who he is. Believe that there's nothing impossible. Believe that when he speaks and when he gives a promise, it's a, it's a done deal. Paul looked at those guys and said, hey, the wind was raging. The storm was going crazy. The boat was starting to come apart. And the guys are looking at Paul and he's just like, chill out, guys. Have a Twinkie. It's all right. I'm sorry. The Twinkie was not in there, I'm sure. It's like, just stay with me. But Paul, man, we got to throw all this stuff off. We've got to save ourselves. Just stay with me. Then they were secretly, you know, trying to get the boats, and they were going to escape from the boat, the, the, the commander's people, the, the armies. They were going to leave all the prisoners on the boat and let them drown. But Paul went to the captain, and he said, look, the Lord spoke to me. Everyone who stays with me is going to be safe. You better hear me. And the, the captain, he loved Paul and he appreciated Paul. And he followed Paul and he cut all the lifeboats so that nobody could get off the ship. And in the process, all 276 men were saved. Was the ship? No. Did it fall apart? Yes. Was there anything left? No. Splinters. And the people that could swim were challenged to swim, while the others were told, grab a plank. But in the process, they all made it to shore. God will never fail to fulfill his promise. If he said it, it's as good as having $4 million in the bank. If he said it, it's done. It's settled. And when we understand that, we look at our lives. We look at our callings. We look at our ministry. We look at what God has challenged us and put down deep inside of our hearts to accomplish and to do for him. Given us talent, given us ability, given us vision, given us dreams. And yet, when the winds of adversity and the troubles and the storms and the trials come, we're the first to sit down and say, I'm done. I can't do it. He must not have really called me. I, I, must not, I must not have heard right. Oh, man. You heard right. You heard him. Don't doubt him now. It doesn't matter. You get to the island. You're on the island. You're building a fire for everybody else. and You want them to all be warm. They're cold. They've been in the freezing waters of that, that storm. And, and they're sitting with you on this island. You build a fire. And suddenly, out of nowhere, you're trying to do good. A viper comes out of the wood that you gathered and bites you on the hand, filling your body with poison. That's what happened to Paul. That's what happened next. You'd think once he got to the island that he's going to get a break. The poison did nothing because Paul had a promise. As long as he has that promise, oh, I feel the Lord this morning. As long as you've got that promise, it doesn't matter what happens next. Doesn't matter what you fight. Doesn't matter what you face. It says the, all the islanders looked at Paul and stared at him and waited for him to swell up and die. Oh, there's so many parallels there. So many parallels to life. People waiting for you. Number one, they're all... People saying, yeah, the ship was gone. Yeah, that's, that's God all right. Yeah, it was God. You know, God shows us that we don't need anything else. 
I think he had to get rid of that ship so that nobody would say, well, thank goodness the wind didn't overtake the ship and the ship saved us. No, it was completely gone because the testimony needed to be that God took care of them. God rescued them. God kept them because of promise. They get to the island, the viper bite, bites on, on Paul, and they're waiting for him to die. Man, people will be sitting around watching you, waiting for you to fail, waiting for you to die, waiting for it to all be over. Man, that is just the way it is with humans. Humans. Waiting for you to die, but he never even swelled up. Because it didn't matter. Because Paul had a promise. When you've got the promise, you have, you have the victory already. You, you're there already. Stand with me, please. Paul went through an awful lot. He went through so many different things that, man, if anybody deserved to throw in the towel, that would have been Paul. After all he'd been through, and when you took the, take the list in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of all the things, you know, beaten 39 times and kidnapped and dropped down in a basket and stoned, they were always trying to kill him. He never got a break. But none of those things ever broke him. Didn't matter what he faced, nothing worked against him. Because he had a promise. But if anybody deserved to throw in the towel, Paul did. But you know what? All he had to say was, I'm going to Rome. I'm going to Rome. I'm going to stand before Caesar in Rome. And even though the storm is raging, it's ugly all around me. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I'm sick. I've got this. I've been fired. I, I've got everything else going. I mean, nothing is going right. I can't get a break. Maybe you've said those very words. Let me clue you in on something. Don't tie his hands because he will come through. I can testify to you I'm an old man as of yesterday. <laughs> He's never failed me. He's never forsaken me. He has always come through. Always. There were times it seemed hopeless, but I asked him for hope. There were times in my life, Angel, where it was desperate. I didn't see any comfort, any way out. But he showed up, pulled me out, pulled me up, gave me a sign. He always comes through for his kids. Always. And he's going to come through for you. If you're at a place in your life this morning where you have dealt with attacks from every side, you, you feel the weight of all the circumstances that seem to be stacked against you, I want you to have faith and have hope. I want you to believe this morning he is going to bring you out. That may be a simple message, but I feel this is what the Lord gave me for this morning, that someone would be here, someone would be in this service that would need those life-saving words. Would you, you're standing next to someone, possibly family, whatever, would you just put a hand on their shoulder as you're standing right there with them. Make contact with them. Look at them and say, we're going to Rome. You're going to Rome. Doesn't matter what it looks like, you're going to Rome. God is with you. 
And he's not going to leave you. He's going to take you all the way. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And God, I thank you for the promises in your word. What would we do without them? That's our, our anchor. It's what we hold on to. It's what we carry with us. And Lord, when the whole world turns its back on you, when, when it seems that the world is just mocking you left and right, when it feels, Lord, like we're all alone, we are not. For you said you'd never leave and you'd never forsake us. You said you'd be with us all the way to the end of the age. And so we know and we understand and it's refreshed in our hearts that you, you are a God of your word. That you are a God of promise. And that your promises are yes and amen. And Lord, we thank you today and we hold to them and we'll carry them in our hearts from this place. And Lord, it'll change our attitude for when we have hope and when we have faith. Lord, it changes everything. It puts a smile back on our face. We're, we're not worried. We're not stressed out. We're not defeated. We're not depressed. No, we can't be when we have hope and when we have faith. I'll see it when I believe it. And I pray that over this congregation this morning. I pray that you would guide and direct our ministries, our, our faithful pastors and our leaders, our teachers. Touch us together. Help every man, woman, boy, and girl in their lives. No matter what they're going through, no matter what the storm looks like, help them to trust you. I pray for healing today. I pray for strength today, provision. I pray for deliverance. And I pray all of it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you.